Okay, well, welcome everybody. And uh, it's seven o'clock. And before we get started, everybody give Anne a big round of applause. She found the baby. Yay! We're not sure what that means. I think she has to do cleanup. Oh! You're the cleanup. Well, leave with your strengths. Yes. So, uh, welcome. Let's uh, let's open tonight with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you so much for all your blessings. You are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. Your mercies are new every morning, and we are so grateful. Thank you for your word, Lord. We are eager to dig into it tonight, and we recognize again we need your help with this, so please send your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and to help us to hear and receive and to understand and to apply what you are saying to us tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we are continuing with John. We, depending on who you talk to and how they draw the lines, we either have finished the upper room discourse or the farewell discourse, whatever you want to call it, that longest teaching that Jesus gives in the Gospels, or today we are finishing that discourse. It just depends on whether you tack <coughs> chapter 17 on or you let chapter 17 stand on its own. Everybody's got their own organizational system. You can pick whatever one you like. But remember, Jesus has said he's going away. And where he's going, the disciples are not able to come. They're troubled. But Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled, that he is going away for their own good, and that he is going to send the Holy Spirit to empower them and to lead them and guide them into all truth, and that through him they will do greater things than even Jesus himself has done. He is going to empower them to love one another as I have loved you. That's the new commandment that he gave in the upper room there and a commandment which he himself demonstrated by washing their feet, and as he's about to demonstrate, once we get to the next chapter, as we begin the Passion narrative with the Garden of Gethsemane and going on to Good Friday. But we're pausing today, we're looking at John chapter 17, which I believe is the longest prayer recorded from Jesus in the Gospels. I like to call it the real Lord's Prayer um, because the what we call the Lord's Prayer is really the pattern the Lord gave us for us to pray. Here is a prayer that he prays, um, and we're going to see he prays for three things. He prays for himself, so all of those people that have come to me and have said, I don't like to pray for myself. It feels selfish. Jesus did. It's not <laughs> selfish. <laughs> God commands you. Pray. Ask your Father who loves you. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples. They're with them. And then, what I find absolutely wonderful and amazing, he prays for us. We're going to see at the end of the chapter where he talks about us and has things that he asks the Father <coughs> to give and to us and to bless us with. A direct prayer from the lips of our Savior for us. Doesn't get any better than that, right? So let's dig in. We're just going to look at uh, uh, this one section today, chapter 17. And uh, who would like to read that for us today? Lisa, thank you. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. 
Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. <clears throat> but now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Okay. Nobody ever accused John of being overly clear. I understand. <laughs> but remember the, the last thing that Jesus said before this. That wonderful ending to John chapter 16. In this, world you will. In this world you will have tribulation or trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. <clears throat> Just absolutely amazing. Right? Just absolutely amazing. A peace that you can hold on to. In the midst of those troubles, when those troubles come, you don't have to be shocked and surprised, and you don't have to think, gee, God must be slipping. Because he told us this was going to happen. And he told us he's overcome the world. So the one who's fighting against us is already defeated. And then after this, he then lifts his eyes up to heaven and begins to pray for, as I said, several things. By the way, the, the, the general posture of prayer was standing up, arms uplifted, often eyes uplifted. They didn't necessarily fold their hands and bow their heads and close their eyes. There's nothing wrong with either of those postures. But often, if you will see, especially uh, a Hasidic Jewish person pray, you'll see them, arms outstretched, often swaying, back and forth, sometimes kind of chanting their prayers, half singing, half talking. Uh, it's just a different style, um, and this is how Jesus was trained. So he lifts his eyes up to heaven, and he prays again. We've, we've seen this over and over again. Finally, the hour has come, and that's the hour where Jesus is going to fulfill his purpose for coming to earth. The fullness of time has come. This is it, basically. 
Jesus is saying. This hour has finally come. What, in terms of the book of Esther, some of you know, Esther, you may have come here for such a time as this, right? We all have that. We're here. This is my big moment, my purpose for doing what I'm here for. And it's interesting, as I said, he begins to pray for himself. He prays, since the hour has come, the hour where I'm going to be obedient and do what you have sent me to do. Therefore, glorify me, Jesus says, Father, glorify your Son, that I may glorify you. So we have this mutual glorification. Father, you lift me up and give me the glory, the greatness, the splendor, the majesty, the power, the wonderfulness that is rightfully mine, and I, in turn, will give that what is rightfully yours to you. We have this relationship of mutuality between the Father and the Son on display here, and we'll talk more about what that means uh, in a little bit. Um, this is not language that we would use because we're not God, right? This is deity. The, the God, the Son, is talking to God the Father. We are neither of those things. We give glory to God because it is rightfully His. We don't ask God, glorify me. Mm -hmm. That's a little... Presumptuous. Just a tad. Yeah, just a tad <laughs> presumptuous. But again, he's claiming deity here, and rightfully so. He's saying, Lord, I set aside... You know, we read in Philippians, Jesus <clears throat> set aside his glory for a time to humble himself by coming to earth as a human being and to die on a cross. So he's saying that hour is coming when I have fulfilled that. And he's speaking kind of in that, that it's, all, like it's almost already done. But of course he still has to go through it. Then he's saying, I will have done everything you have asked me to do. Now, Lord, raise me back up where, where I belong. Um, and it's kind of strange because his greatest glory the most glorious and wonderful thing that he does, the most amazing thing that he does, is the cross, right? And it's not a very glorious sight, is it? Most of us would look away. Let's be honest. You know, I, <laughs> I played a game once, uh, an icebreaker, in a Christian group I was in, and it was, if you could go back to biblical times, and be a fly on the wall for one event, what event would you choose? And by the way, there is a right answer. The Ascension? Um, the Ascension? You'd like that? That bit, yeah. Up, up and away. <laughs> <laughs> That's 40 days that he was here. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Um, nobody picked Good Friday. No. Why would you? I, I couldn't. It's horrific. I could, it, it's good, but I couldn't. Some wanted to see David and Goliath. Some wanted to see Queen Esther. Not the beginning of Esther. Um, because no. Um, but others, you know, that. And the right answer, I said, I want to walk along the road to Emmaus where Jesus opens up the scriptures and explains the whole Old Testament. Like the, the best Bible study ever, oh, yeah. <laughs> where the author <laughs> explains yeah. the book. I, I, I want to do it. That to me, that's the right answer. But others tell me it's a matter of opinion, and I need to be quiet. So, um, but yeah, I, 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 I couldn't see it. But that's his greatest glory. That's the most glorious thing he did. When we see him in heaven, he will still bear his scars. We'll get to look on them, John says in Revelation, and we'll marvel because those scars are for us. You know, that bought our salvation, those nail prints, and the Romans considered the wrist to be part of the hand. Mm -hmm. um, 
they wouldn't have been able to hang on the cross if they put the right. nail here. It's just not strong enough, so they put it through the wrist. Um, so this obedience will be his greatest glory and will give the Father the greatest glory as well, which is remarkable to think about. God humbling himself brings God his greatest glory. That tells us how we should live our lives, right? And humbling ourselves, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So Jesus then goes on to say, God, you have given me, because he's speaking in the third person, authority over all flesh, in that sense meaning humanity, all human beings, to give eternal life to all you have given me. So all that the Father has chosen for eternal life, Jesus says, has slash will receive eternal life from Jesus the Son. And then he defines eternal life. If you've ever wanted to know, here's another one of those great verses to commit to memory. This was John Calvin's favorite verse of scripture. It was his life verse. It's what he based his life on, John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's salvation. Knowing God. Salvation is a relationship. So often we forget that. We think salvation is, I've got my fire insurance. It's been signed. I signed the card, right? Now I can go do what I want. And I got my get into heaven free card, right? Or sure, you know, you, you see all the mobsters in the, the movie lined up for confession and they, they say their confession, and then they go off and do another night of gun running and booze smuggling and killing and all of that. But they went to confession, so they're fine, right? It's good. They, 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 they got the box ticked. Everything's real good and right. No, this is salvation. This is eternal life. To know God through Jesus Christ. Not to know about God. That's an entirely different category. A lot of people know about God, but they don't know God. One of my cousins just went through this. He, talking with him, he loved theological arguing. He loved debate. You met him in seminary, right, Olivia? The people that, they loved their own voice, and they loved to talk and talk and talk and talk. And he knew a whole heck of a lot. But just this past year, he finally, and he said, it's a night and day difference. He says, I thought I knew the Lord, I didn't. He said, now I know the Lord. And his wife is saying, and he's finally a wonderful person. <laughs> you know, he's changed night and day. His, his kids are happier. And, you know, it, it, there's a, a night and day change in him. He knew a lot about God. He didn't know God. That's a completely different thing. That is eternal, because eternal life is going to go to be with Jesus for all eternity. You want to make sure you know the person whose house you're going to stay at, right? It's awkward to stay in the house of a stranger. We've all done it. Like you kind of, where's the bathroom again? When are we having breakfast? You want to know the person you're going to go stay with. So this is salvation, having a heart relationship, not just head knowledge, but a heart knowledge, a life knowledge, knowing God, which again means Jesus is one of a kind. This is eternal life. We know the one true God through Jesus Christ, his son. So he says, I glorify you on earth, Father, I accomplished the work that you gave me to do, which was to point, to tell people about you. <clears throat> my job here is so that they know you and have salvation. My job is to be 
this is called the high priestly prayer. That's the heading in, in, in my Bible here. The priest is the one who bridges the gap between God and humanity. The priest is the one that makes it possible for us to go into the presence of God, to talk to God. If you notice, in the Presbyterian church, I'm not a priest. Because you don't need me to talk to God. You can talk to God. How can you do that? In Jesus' name. He's the priest. That's why he came to earth. So that we can go to God. And you can pray at home. By yourself. You don't have to come to me and ask me to pray for you. I will pray for you. I gladly pray for you. I love to pray for you. Do not ever hesitate not to ask me to pray for you. But you don't need me. You can pray to God as well. We'll pray together. <laughs> you pray and I pray. That's great. But you don't need me. You can pray through Jesus Christ. He's made this possible. But he is one of a kind. And he asked, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Lord, I am asking when I have obeyed what you have called me to do, that I am able to return to the glorious existence at the right hand of the Father that I had from before creation even began. To return to that wonderful state. Again, showing the deity of Christ that he has always been and always will be equal to the Father. But for a brief period, he humbled himself coming to earth so that we might know the Father. And then he's going to go back and we'll see, we'll go to be with him when he returns for us. So that's the first five verses there. He prays for himself, knowing what is about to happen. Then in verse 6, he shifts, and he pray, begins to pray for his disciples who are there with him. I have manifested your name, he says to God, to the Father, to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word, now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. So, God, you chose these people. You gave them to me. I've been here three years. I've been obedient to you. I have taught them everything that they need to know. I've shown you to them through me. They now, because remember back in uh, chapter 16, the disciples finally said, Oh, we finally get it, right? <laughs> uh, they had a tiny little breakthrough, but yeah, they didn't really. Not yet. But they said they did. And so he's... Now they know everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. They have received them. They have come to know in truth that I came from you. And have believed that you sent me. So my work is done. You gave me things to teach. I taught them. They've received them. They know I am your son. I am the Savior. They know all that they need to know at this point. Now... I, verse 9, I am praying for them. And he then gives a distinction. I'm not praying for the whole world. I'm praying for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. This makes a lot of people mad. Um, because we're talking about, in Presbyterian terms, the doctrine of election. You did not choose me, Jesus said. I chose you, that you may go and bear fruit. We love because he first loved us. He's praying for everybody belongs to him by creation, not everybody belongs to him through salvation. And he's praying for those who belong to him because they were chosen by God to have faith. All mine are yours, all yours are mine. I am glorified in them. And why is he praying for those who believe? Verse 11, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm praying for them because I'm going away, and they're going to stay here. So they're going to need help, Lord. You gave them to me. I taught them everything they need to know. They received what I needed to teach. Now I'm going to go away 
we can see he's going to die, he's going to rise again, 40 days after the resurrection, he's going to ascend back to heaven. I'm coming to you, Holy Father, now you keep them in your name. Keep them safe. Keep them faithful. This idea of God being a keeper. We read Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord is your keeper. It repeats over and over again. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep your going out and your, your coming forth both now and forevermore. What does that mean, keeper? Well, in one sense, we think of a zookeeper, right? Caregiver. Caregiver, provider, protector, all of that, yeah. The one who looks out for us and keeps us from harm, keeps us safe. Lord, I am praying, since I'm going away, but they're going to stay here, that you will take over keeper duty. I did it, and now I'm giving it back to you. What an amazing thought there. Um, while I was with them, I kept them in your name. Verse 12. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Judas. Yes. Oh. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So, Lord, they're going to be in a precarious position, because they're going to be in the world, but the world is going to hate them. They're going to be in the world, but they're not of the world. They don't belong to the world. They belong to you, Lord. And so that's why they need your protection. That's why they need your blessing. That's why we need God to be our keeper. He's going away. The disciples are going to stay. Notice he doesn't say, Lord, take them out of the world. He doesn't say, let them retreat away from the world. That's our instinct sometimes, right? Nasty and dangerous out there. I'm going to retreat. That's what... The monastics did for so long. Monks and nuns let the world go to hell. We're going to stay behind these walls and pray. And God used them. He preserved a lot of books, knowledge, and, and all that through them. A lot of, you know, flowering of Christian theology through the monks and the nuns all through the ages. But if you're behind these walls, praying seven times a day, that's great. But how's that helping them over there? It's not. Well, that's certainly why Jesus came here. Right. He came to us. To, so that we would have that. Otherwise, it would have been very much the same situation for us yeah. had he not come. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we're called to go into the world and make disciples. Yeah. So, the Lord will be our keeper. Um sanctify them in the truth your word is truth it's interesting he doesn't say that his your word is true he says your word is truth that's a big difference yeah so, I'm looking here because I, I skipped a piece here that I didn't want to skip over, and I'm trying to find the verse here. Ah, I skipped over back in verse 11. Jump back to verse 11. The second thing he prays for his disciples, that they may be one, even as we are one. Big theme of this prayer. He's praying that his disciples have <coughs> unity. And we see, as he goes on later, in the Word, the Word is truth. Unity in our, uh, our calling to be in the world and to be separate from the world. But what an amazing kind of unity that is, because think of the unity between God the Father and God the Son. It doesn't get more united than that, right? And he's praying that we will have that same unity. 
A lot of people point out this is one of the few prayers we see from Jesus that has not yet been fulfilled. Because is the church around the world one? No. Well, yeah, not really. Yeah, no, no, not really. I remember when I was in Israel, I was at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is supposedly the church built on the site where Jesus was crucified and then buried. It is run by four separate <coughs> sects in the Christian faith. There's the Roman Catholics, there's the Armenian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, and I forget what the fourth one was. And they all are very, very competitive over who controls what part of the church. <laughs> And if somebody steps over the line, it's no, <clears throat> oh, you didn't mean to. We forgive you. There was actually a fist fight that broke out between several monks <laughs> while I was there. It wasn't a great witness mm -hmm. to the world. Especially to a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, yeah. I was happy to get out of there, actually. <clears throat> Too much incense and stank. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this is one prayer that we're still waiting to be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled because all of Christ's prayers will be fulfilled, right? Praise God. But this one we're still waiting for. So uh, we didn't want to skip over that. Um, he prays that we would be one. Something to remember when we come into conflict with each other. Uh, to continue to seek to be one. In Christ, what has to be in Christ. There's otherwise, it's a false unity. It has to be in Christ. He prays that we would be kept from the evil one. He tells us we are to be one in His Word. Sanctify them, make them holy, make them strong in the truth. Your Word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So all of this for his disciples. Make them one. Which, when not too long ago they were arguing over which one of them was greatest, right. and who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand, and who was going to sit at his left hand, yeah, that's a prayer that maybe needed to be prayed, right? Well, then they're going to scatter, so they won't even have right. unity as a body. Right, and are we going to let Peter back after what he did? <laughs> And, and they're going to face uh, controversy where they go. Oh, yeah. And so they really have to depend on God yeah. and Jesus, even though they're they're not here. They have to be united with him right. to get through that tough time. Yeah, otherwise you're stuck. Yeah. If we're not in Christ and, and in the word and remembering, <laughs> who else would enable us to think that we <clears throat> could go into the world and actually make a difference. You know, I'm not saying we're not an unremarkable, we're a pretty remarkable group of people, I think. But would anybody gather this group of people together and say, okay, they're going to go out and make a difference in the world? <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> well, it depends on what you think is making a difference. True. Because there's great things that happen, but every little thing that we do for somebody else is, is a gift. That's how God works, tiny little things. I mean, I think this church does a lot of good for oh a lot goodness. of people. Every time we put the annual report together, and I really hope you've read it, if not, shame on you. Um, Every time we put it together and I look and I see, because I edit it to make sure it all, and I see what we did in a year, it's sort of like, my wow, goodness, yeah. God did so much. All these things that God did, it's amazing. Um, but it's through him. You know, he's, Jesus is praying as my disciples are sent out, just as God sent me, I'm sending them. Lord, keep them, sanctify them, unify them. Strengthen them in the truth, make them effective, because he knows that's the next step once he has gone through his passion and his resurrection and is sent back into heaven. Then the remarkable part, verse 20. The third thing, I do not ask for these, the disciples 
around him. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That's us. We believe. We're reading right here, right? One of them wrote this down so that we may believe. And he said it how many times already? <laughs> and this is eternal life, that, you know, we may believe in Jesus Christ. This is written that we might have life in all of its abundance. It comes through believing in Jesus Christ. John's testimony here is part of how and why we believe. So Jesus prays for us, verse 21, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that we are connected to the Trinity, that we have God living in and with us, connected as a vine to branches, like a bride to a groom, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Always that mission. Not just for our own sakes, although that's pretty amazing, but that we may be one so that when the world sees us, they see God. They see Jesus. Which is a pretty tall order, right? We need God's help for that. Yeah. In the old... Uh, Presbyterian Book of Order, it used to say the church is a provisional demonstration of what God intends for all humanity. When they look at us, they should see a provisional demonstration of heaven. Provisional because we don't have it all together yet, right? <laughs> We're still learning, still being sharpened, still working on it, but they should see unity and love and kindness and forgiveness and all of those things that are in Christ. They should see that in us and if they're not, then we still got work to do. And we still need God to help us do it. So he prays for us that we may be one, just as the Father and the Son are one, just as we are in them. So the world may see the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Ooh. We have Christ's glory with us. Wow. That they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me. That they may become perfectly one. So that, here's the even more amazing part. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them. Even as you have loved me. God the Father loves us just as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. Somebody here needed to hear that tonight. Ever doubt that you are loved? It's right here. Go back and read John 17. God loves you just as he loves Jesus. Because you are connected to Jesus, right? And in Jesus, he makes you Christ-like. So, when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of his son, the goodness and the blessing of his son. You think he sees all the terrible things that you have done in the past. He doesn't see those anymore because they're covered over by the blood of the son, the blood of Jesus. They are gone. As Corey Ten Boom says, God takes your, your sins and dumps them in the deepest sea and then puts up a sign that says no fishing. When he looks at you, he sees <coughs> Jesus and he loves you as he loves Jesus. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Again, what he's promised in chapter 14, he's going to his father's house. There are, it's a house with many rooms. That where he is, there we may also be for all eternity. I pray that these who will come to believe down through the centuries will also come to be with me through all eternity, where we will be loved perfectly, and we will love each other perfectly. And I don't even have a category in my mind for what that's going to be like, but I want to. What? Oh yeah, 
and everybody will harmonize well. <laughs> so, I won't, re I won't recognize myself. <laughs> yes, you will. You'll say, I'm finally who I was meant to be. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I make known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Have you ever thought about Jesus praying that for you? That we may be united together, united with him, and that his perfect love is ours. If Jesus prayed for it, it's a pretty good prayer, right? It's a prayer that God's going to honor. You happy about this? You sad about this? I'm just getting <laughs> silent. I don't know how to interpret this. It's exciting. <laughs> I think it's overwhelming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a blessing that John included this. And I want to go to Matthew and Mark and Luke and say, why did you leave that out? That's good. It must be a huge place up there. Yeah. If we're all going to be there. Yeah. Oh, we're all going to have our own room. Yeah, it must be a huge, huge place. That's going to have a lot of peanut butter, I can tell you that. It's my favorite. Yeah. So, again, this, this flow, the Father gave to the Son, the Son gave to us to the disciples, the disciples give to the world so that we all may be one in the Son and the Father. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us to do that all together, unity and blessing and love. Um, questions, thoughts? We're going to get out early tonight. I hope that's okay. I just knew that was, we couldn't handle more than that. <laughs> just a reminder, next week, no Bible study. I will be up with my mom and my sister, and my niece is flying out to Ohio to see whether she wants to move out here. Oh, yes. Where is she? Oregon. Oh, she's... Uh, the one who spent part of her high school years here. Yes. Yeah. So... Um, Lydia. Lydia. Close. Uh, Phyllis, our extraordinary librarian, wanted you all to know that the book that Rita talked about last week uh, by Francis Chan, Forgotten God, All About the Holy Spirit, we have our very own copy, brand new in the library. All you have to do is come, hey, remember these? <laughs> we still have an old school system because it's a small library. All you have to do, the first one who wants to read it, check it out, just write your name on the card, give the card to her. And is it $5 a book? <laughs> yes. It all goes to a good cause. Um, but this is available and uh, for whomever would like to read more about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when we come back in two weeks, be prepared because we're going to go to Gethsemane. It's going to be the really, we've already reached that. So perfect for Lent beginning. Yeah. Yes, it is. This Wednesday. Yep. Yeah, no Good timing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Valentine's Day and Lent. Yes. So that's another commercial yes, this right. Wednesday, 7 o'clock at Providence Presbyterian Church in Bright. It's right next to the cemetery. Are you the officiant or is Jerry? Jerry is yes. preaching, I'm leading yes. worship, our yes. choir is singing. Okay, so yeah, every, we both are participating. Um, so be sure to come this Wednesday at 7, and uh, we will begin with Ash, or Lent with uh, good worship, a good way to, to begin. So any other, yes, that's this is a, <clears throat> Where I was last week, this little four-year-old asked her grandma, which do you love the most, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit? She went through what each one of them did, but she really felt like she didn't answer it adequately. Huh. What, would, what would you have said? Yes, which do I love? <laughs> I love all three, yeah. because the three are one. It's hard. I don't know that I can pick the yeah. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
She wasn't sure. I think about how you pray. Especially with a four-year-old. Yeah. I just say Lord. Yeah. Yeah, Father. Well, we're talking to the Father mm -hmm. through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're all involved. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and we don't have to mention the others. I mean, they help us get there. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not leaving anybody out. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. So, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we are stunned and amazed at this prayer that you have prayed and we know continue to pray for us. We do pray that you would help us to be one. Lord, we are divided in so many ways. And some of them are divisions of necessity and, and many of them are not. And so we pray that you would help us to be united in you. Pray that you would sanctify us in your truth, in your word. Pray that you would keep us. Pray that you would remind us each day of this extraordinary love that you give to us in Christ. We pray that you would help us to love others in that same way. As we uh, prepare for this holy season beginning on Wednesday, we pray that you would indeed bless us and draw us near to you. And gather us together again in two weeks, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Help yourself to more pain.